welcome to this episode of the Artist Collective Radio Show. I'm your host, Shoshana Pearson. Today on the show, I have for you Stuart and Diane Sykes. Stuart is a Grammy award-winning record producer, mixer, and sound engineer. And Diane is an artist and program director for Women and Their Work based in Austin, Texas. Today, we talk about the importance of listening to your instincts, trust in your gut when life throws you a curveball, learning to pivot and handle all sorts of challenges as they come. We talked to Stuart and Diane about why they got started in the artistic life and what keeps them going through it all. Stay tuned, like, subscribe, follow. Whether you're listening on a podcast or watching on YouTube, we're certainly glad that you are here today to join us for this grand adventure with Stuart and Diane. So let's go now to them and see what they're up to. And thank you again so much for joining us today on the Artist Collective Radio Show. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Artist Collective Radio Show. It's so good to see you guys. It's been too long since you moved so far down 35 to Austin that I don't get to see you nearly as much. But you look you look good. It looks like the pandemic has um, treated you pretty kindly. How's it going? <laughs> That's one way to put it. Yeah. On <laughs> you, lockdown looks good on you. <laughs> so, tell me how you guys got started into this crazy creative world. So, t- uh, let let's start with your positions. Now, you um, are a, a little bit non traditional artists, as you, if you will. Um, uh, Stuart, you are a producer, sound engineer, mixer, and Diane, you are an artist as well as a program director for an organization, correct? Correct. Right. Okay. Well, where you work. <laughs> yes, I'm the program director <laughs> for women in their work in Austin. And is that a gallery or, uh, an or- tell me a little bit about what that is. Yeah, women in their work is a a visual and performing arts organization, primarily visual arts that um, shows women and women identifying artists, mostly artists that are based in Texas, but we do occasionally bring in women artists from across the country to Texas. And we've been an organization since 1978 and we just moved into a new building. Oh, wow. That's almost, that's almost as old as me. By, yeah. the, by the power of Zoom, yes. bought a new building. <laughs> well, thank goodness. Um, so tell me how you guys got got um, into your respective fields, how you found each other, and that sort of thing. Stuart? Oh, we met in an Oblivion show in Memphis. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how did I get... That was, that's actually where we met on Beale Street, no less. Uh, <laughs> the stuff of um, legends. I, yes. <laughs> look out the Olympians, they put on some good shows. Um, what I start, how did I get So I got, I actually went to school for recording. And then when I was done with school, I got an internship in Memphis. And luckily that studio I got an internship at, I got hired and I was first and I was an assistant. And then I just sort of moved up. And then what, in 2001, we moved to Dallas and that's when I sort of went freelance and then just started working for myself. And I've done that. Why did you go to school for recording? Why was that something that resonated with you as something to pursue? Well, I mean, I was young and I don't know if I knew how (laughs) to do it. (laughs) Also, uh, so I wasn't particularly interested in school. So my dad was especially uh, concerned about that. And so he he (laughs) happened to- As dads tend to to be. Yes. (laughs) He happened to find a, a- the school I ended up going to. And he was like, well, I realized the only thing you have interest in is music. So maybe you should go to this school. So we and went- That, that was full, and, full sale in Florida? Yeah. And before that, like I was sort of like, 
I was planning on either going to, you know, Collin County had a recording program and then they had one at the Art Institute in Dallas. So I had looked at those and then he found that one. And so that's where I ended up going. And it was sort of like on the premise, it's like, oh, you go to this school here and it gives you the ability to become an intern. Here, pay this school a lot of money so you can get a job not making any money. It's a quality career move. I mean, you know, you set your goals high enough and it's, you know, you'll reach them. So <laughs> how about you? living like a king. <laughs> how about you, Diane? How did you get in involved in art when did that start for you and uh when did you go to, tell me about your start yeah I started out I went to the University of Memphis for undergrad and kind of thought I would study maybe graphic design because also my parents were worried about like you're interested in the arts but can you really make a living as an artist and um they were like maybe education, but when I was in school, I like fell in love with sculpture. So I ended up getting a degree um, in sculpture. And then like after, after that, I spent a year in a bronze foundry and like learned how to weld. And I was like, I'm gonna be a real sculptor. And then I was like, I need to go to grad school and finish grad school also in sculpture. And then, then started teaching at like uh, UTA in Arlington and some of the community colleges in Dallas. And then from there moved into museum work. So it started out as like being a maker and now kind of moving more into the, I guess the behind the scenes like administrative role in the arts. Do you still do any of your own work or I not have to as much say, anymore? Not as much anymore. Like definitely I would say like working in a nonprofit is is not just a 40 hour a week job. And so there's a lot of like overtime with it. And sometimes I'm just kind of exhausted and like yeah don't have that creative energy. Mm -hmm. But it is something that like I still kind of struggle with like trying to create that time and create that balance. So I don't want to say I'm never I'm going to do it again, but it's definitely been on pause. <laughs> How has uh, your experience as an artist informed what you do at women in their work? How has that, how has that helped you interact with other artists or create the programs that you do? Yeah, I think it definitely affects that because like, most of the exhibitions the artists are creating new work and mm -hmm. so there's not like a lot of information about it and so you're kind of helping them interpret their work you know mm. whether it's like to explain it to the general public or to school kids that come in and so I think having a background in the arts like I understand sort of the mechanics of it as well as like, you know, from studying art history and whatnot can mm -hmm. kind of put it into context. Mm -hmm. So I definitely mm -hmm. think it helps. And, you know, a lot of people that work in museums study like art education and stuff. And I don't come from that background. So, but I do think studying the arts like as a practicing artist helps mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Stuart, you work with a whole range of different types of musicians from the completely unknown to the world renowned. So tell me how, um, how that came to be, how you built that up from going from an intern to a freelancer in Dallas. How, um, how did you, what was your in and how do you maintain that and balance it with all the different styles and uh i think so in memphis like you know i went the studio i worked at in memphis was was really well known for working with uh like up and coming sort of indie rock bands mm -hmm. and so you know i got to work with 
a lot of bands that were coming out like on you know sympathy for the record industry and matador records and sub pop and stuff like that and so you know i became i stayed friends with a lot of people and then um i think there's also luck involved <laughs> uh being yeah. in the right place at the right time you know that and it's all I am the world's worst. Um, I can't really, I, I can't, I'm not good at promoting myself. So mm -hmm. I've been lucky, like everything I've gotten has all been sort of through word of mouth, which I think says a lot, but uh, it Absolutely. sure is not been for me promoting myself. <laughs> well, I, you know, since I've been doing this, that's been one of the things that a lot of the people I talk to say is they're not good at it they're not good at self-promotion it feels awkward and uncomfortable and, and and it's not an easy thing to do so uh, there's a lot it's of also come, it's a lot of, I think musicians and artists too like you know if someone's recommended by a peer that they respect like that goes way further than me being a you know salesman going oh yeah come I'll make sure. you guys a star <laughs> so you know, you're gonna make yourself a star i'm not i'm just gonna help make a good record is that is that kind of how you view your role as to just polish up the jewel that's there or what do you how do you see your role in the i mean yeah my making? job is to make the band sound as you know better than they thought they could and that's like either just being like they're biggest proponent in the studio or just or helping them like change a bridge or something you know it's all it totally changes from record to record but you have and to sort of quickly figure out what they need you to do and you know that also involves like making people comfortable in the studio you know it's not it's not really an environment that a lot of people like get you have you get used to it but it, when you first start recording like you know it's pretty nerve-wracking yeah so you have to make them comfortable otherwise you know they're going to get down on themselves quickly and they're not going to perform as well as they can and so it's and up to you to and how do them. you do that what what kind of like just talking think, to right, them well it depends fine <laughs> liquor <laughs> no you just sort of have to you, you gotta just try and read the room really quickly and figure out what i mean there's no one way to do it um mm -hmm. you just have to yeah you gotta you gotta be good at sort of reading people and figuring out what what they need to be their best um yeah whether it's liquor's not usually <laughs> something that comes first in that equation but <laughs> Sometimes. Well, it, it you know it strikes me that you guys it sounds like you kind of do similar things for different creators um you're making them comfortable in their own skin and kind of empowering them to believe in their own craft to to put it out there so you're actually it sounds like you're both working to empower um other artists to to promote themselves which is funny because I, I don't know either of you to be very good at or very you know self-promotional not that you're not good at it you're just it's you're just some of the most humble people that I know and you're you would rather like redirect people to others so I I think that's an interesting dynamic um about the two of you so how did you guys you met at at an oblivion show so how did you um how did how did it come to be that uh you started talking about your artistic lives and how do you how did you both decide that this artistic life was what you both wanted and i don't know if we ever like sat down and had like a really structured conversation about it. like all of, all of my conversations are structured yeah <laughs> like here's where we're gonna be in 20 years <laughs> but yeah i was in Somewhere, somewhere that took a curveball, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was studying art and, you know, honestly, I had no idea what I was really going to do. Stuart was already working at Easley and 
was already pursuing engineering. Um, so I don't know. I will say like. <clears throat> I started, sorry to interject, okay. but you know, I, st <laughs> I started, how old was I? I think I was 22 when I started at Easy. Easily Recording in Memphis. So there was really not a conversation with anyone about what I was going to do because I was doing it. Yeah. You know, and we met and I was already doing it. And, you know, Diane's been my biggest supporter for my whole career. So it was never really like a question of like, yeah, your job's cool right now, but maybe you should do something else <laughs> because, you know, whatever. But it was never the case. Yeah. And I would say like, so like after going to undergrad and grad school in Memphis, like, and particularly at the time in Memphis, there were not a ton of like visual art jobs. And Stuart, when I met him was like, he was from Texas, but was like, I'll never live there again. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Like, <laughs> but then after I graduated, it was like, we need to go somewhere else. Like, I can't make a living here. And it seems, you know, like I've spent all this time studying art and that's what I want to do to like now just take a job somewhere else in a different field without even trying. So inevitably Dallas popped up as a place, one that had a ton of universities and it seemed like a place where I could get started teaching because at the time I thought that was the route I wanted to go into teaching art and you know we did I guess then at that point we did talk about like where could we go we like thought of several cities and then Dallas started to make more sense and hmm. Stuart knew people in Dallas I had met a few people and we were like Oh, I've lost you. Okay. Okay. Back in. Hopefully no more acts of God will terrify us. Yeah. And freeze us up. Okay. What were we saying? Okay. So you oh, had no, about moving to Dallas. <laughs> yes, you had you couldn't find work in Memphis in, in the art world. So Dallas Looking was at, beckoning. We we, we were drawing you, beckoning. drawing you. <laughs> we're like, come on, yeah, come a, on. We had, a, we had a three year plan. Yes, that was the thing. We were gonna live in Dallas three to five years uh i would get experience and then we would go like where wherever we were gonna go <laughs> i don't know i feel like i feel like somebody's trying to tell you something maybe you need to come back to dallas is that what that store was saying <laughs> so yeah so we moved to dallas and like the first six months were horrible awful <laughs> <laughs> We were like, oh, we've made a mistake. Um, we also moved a month after 9-11. Uh, so uh, for me, probably that was not everywhere a great time bad. to move. <laughs> right. Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. I moved so to Dallas cool. in December that year. So we, oh, were, wow. we were getting here about the same time, I guess. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, so it's slowly like things started to kind of fall in place and Stuart started getting a lot of work and got kind of plugged in with uh, different studios. And then I started teaching and then joined this group called 500X, which is an mm -hmm. artist co-op and was able to show work. And so it ended up being like really great. and. Mm. Then, Actually, Peter Schmidt was a big help when we first moved to Dallas. I thought oh. you <laughs> did. Did you know him prior, or you met him once you got here? No. Well, I, yeah, we had met. I'd met. He lived with Jerome, you know, for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a mutual friend for all those people that are saying, <laughs> Jero oh, Jerome. Yeah. Jerome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, pretty much. <laughs> uh, so I met him through that through through Jerome and. Uh, yeah, we had like, we had come to Austin and gotten an apartment like six months after we moved to Dallas. Mm. We're like, 
I don't think this place is for us. And then, <laughs> like, we were driving home, and it was like, we were broke, broke, broke. I was like, I don't know how we're going to afford a deposit and all this stuff. And then. And we were in a lease, and I was like, it was like, this is crazy. But. <laughs> but Peter had a had a heart-to-heart -heart with Diane. And, oh. Because uh, at the time, I was working at Borders, and he came in, and he was like, I heard you guys uh, went to Austin and, you know, things are kind of rough and it's kind of hard. And then he told me that Dallas was not a good place to visit, <laughs> that we needed to either commit and then things would start to open up. But if we were just kind of hanging out, like not really committing, that it was always going to be hard. And interesting. I don't know. Yeah. And it's like, it really made a lot of sense and i would say in the background he did a lot of work to get stewart bands and yeah he got me um, double bands right at the beginning which was really awesome yeah because once it starts then like as stewart was saying like it becomes word of mouth but it's like getting the ball rolling is like right. sometimes the hardest part right so yeah, yeah. i hear that you know, five years turned into 11. <laughs> wow <laughs> Still not as long as I've been here, but you know, it's longer, <laughs> longer, yeah, longer. So you started, um, so you were teaching, right? When you were here and you were still showing your own work at the, while you were still, while you were here, is that right? Yeah. And then I, shows? I left teaching and took a job at Dallas Contemporary and started doing arts education programming mm. there. And so it kind of opened up what the idea of educating could be. And mm. I really liked that. Like I liked like teaching studio classes, but I would also teach like art appreciation classes to like 90% of the people hated art. And it was just like, wow, like why? Like people aren't just like apathetic towards it. They're like, like you know very much like this is not for me and it's this world that I don't have access to mm. and so being in a museum doing education I hope that like I can like be that bridge that can make mm. it more accessible and so like helping to interpret art to a general public or to kids because they're the ones like if they don't grow up with access to art, then well, obviously they wouldn't feel a connection to it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I feel pretty passionate about like making that accessible and really part of someone's like whole life. And so it does start early. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing before we left. I did that like the last five years of us living in Dallas. And, and Stuart, you had uh, gotten the studio in Oak Cliff by that point, or did you do that right away and build that out right away? Was that always your uh, recording home or? We no, built we it a couple. In, yeah. Oh, okay. We built it in 2006, seven. seven. Yeah, seven. We bought it. We bought the building in 2006. So we thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we had an interesting deal on the building we bought, we bought a building from a woman who didn't actually own the building which we oh. didn't find out till we started demoing the building <laughs> <laughs> and, and luckily the the woman that we so the woman we thought we bought it from she was friends with the woman who actually owned it and was renting the friends. building renting to, renting to own mm. And so the woman who actually owned it was like super awesome. And like, she like accepted the deal and like she took a bath on it because the other woman kept, you know, our down payment. But like we've signed a legal, you know, we bought it like out Like for real. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But that was like kind of a little scary time. They were like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you, you get, you see news reports of people doing that, like selling other well, people's We had already property. demolished the whole place. So it was like, she's like, yeah, I'll take it back, but you got to put it back together. It was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm glad that that worked out. Um, 
So yeah, from 2007, then on the studio was in Elmwood. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And is that, is that where you started picking up steam or had you already built, um, some of your clientele when in the scope of all this, when did you, when did you, uh, get that Grammy, get the pudding from uh, Loretta Lynn's? When did you start having, I think that was 2004. Yeah. Okay. And kind of leading up to us buying the studio, like Stuart was doing a ton of travel. So he was like Mm. already getting like a lot of momentum and like he traveled a ton and for like two years I pretty much was gone and then I just started like probing people asking them I was like you know if I had a space would you come oh and you know some people a lot of people said yes you know some people like nah, I'm not gonna go there but uh so then you know that kind of gave us the confidence to like and then it also took a long time to find a building that we could afford that could be usable for a studio so yeah Stuart so, got really really adept at like driving through these neighborhoods in Dallas and he'd see the smallest like for rent or for sale sign and be like that's it <laughs> this took us like <laughs> a year or two <laughs> it, so um so you basically opened the studio to keep to to stay home more is that right to stay closer to home and not have to travel as much yeah, that and like, I mean, it's 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 cool to go and work in other studios and freelance, but like, I was more and more going like, oh, I wish there was this thing, or I wish that, oh, you have this piece of equipment, but it doesn't work, and I'd be like, oh, that sucks, and so, yeah, I sort of grew, I was like, well, and I had another place that was like our practice space that, t- actually, we shared it with Pleasant Grove. Mm. and then that place flooded and so it kind of ruined a bunch of stuff that I had so it was like okay if I'm ever going to do this again I'm going to own a building Mm. yeah it was like mostly it was just like I want a place that's my place that I can uh make it how I want it and have the equipment Mm -hmm. that I want and so I was lucky enough to be able to do it and you know kind of it a lot of work (laughs) what do you think was the hardest most challenging part of that that period of time for your lives for both of you well diane basically was working two jobs at that point (laughs) because she would work and then at night come over to the studio and help so we built the studio it was like me and a bunch of friends built it Mm. so because we had gotten someone to like to a, a proposal or a bid and it was just like we're never going to be able to afford that and so then we, like, had, we had an investor that bailed like two weeks before mm. we were supposed to start mm. the building but actually it was probably that was, probably that was good. really good that that happened but but did you feel uh at that point did you feel like the, the ground fall out from underneath you where you had the, everything was lined up and planned and then all of a sudden you were you know scrambling tell me how that felt and how that did did that affect you mentally at all because i went into a pretty dark place (laughs) yeah it was depressing and i'd go over there and it would be just a just a bunch of rubble and so finally i was just like okay i got a i got a personal loan it was like this is how much i have this is what we can do. And we just did it. And it was like, and we, we learned like, a lot of things about construction. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and luckily next to that building, there was a guy that helped really teach yeah, us how to do lot. it. And he worked, he uh-huh. was like, yeah, I'll help you. And he was, he charged us super cheap and he was an awesome dude like him and his son would help some too and like yeah he taught me how to she rock and do all kinds of stuff and yeah probably wouldn't have gotten built without freddie yeah but then yeah tons of musicians 
and other friends came in, like that place would not have been built without like so much support from everybody. Cause yeah, we were like, we don't have the money, but we got the desire. Like, let's figure out like, yeah. And, and you so don't have many options, like you, it helps you like figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then, I that- a, then I booked a band before it was finished so it was like okay there's a deadline (laughs) oh crap (laughs) what what all musicians are excellent at are the deadlines yes (laughs) Uh, but that that sense of community must have really helped you you feel empowered to do what you wanted to do because you had this um community support of your friends and musicians rallying around yes um was that uh like uh to that give you um like uh, what's the word i'm looking for like a like a passion or did that light a fire or did that make you feel like you went through that dark place but now this is maybe the light well it definitely was reassuring you know like probably other people you've talked to like i'm really bad at business so like <laughs> opening a studio like I think it made Diane more nervous than me, but like, uh, yeah, I would have nightmares building it, like about all kinds of things. And so knowing that everybody was into it, I was like, okay, this is, I think this is going to work. But until you start actually working, you know, like leading up to it. Yeah. It's a, it's a stressful situation. (laughs) I I just feel like sometimes it, it helps when we're when we're we feel like we're not just doing it for ourselves when there's a whole you know support system or people just backing you up one way or the other Um, and it helps us to keep going and which is what you guys actually do for other artists so it's it's nice that you felt that yourselves in in a small way so um so now you have a big way yeah um so now you have um been working here both of you and you tell me about your decision to move to austin it's a quick one is it it was we had sort of been talking about (laughs) yeah i don't remember much of a lead up but (laughs) we just lost you one day (laughs) we had sort of been talking about like you know if the opportunity came up like certain cities that we would be into moving to so we had a list we kind of had a list of cities that we were that we were like all right yeah we can move there and then so there was a job back up in austin as diane was like should i apply for that and i was like yeah sure why not and then they called her and was like hey you want to come interview and she's like yeah when like how about this afternoon i was like i live in dallas and they're like Austin's only like three and a half hours away. (laughs) (laughs) So it was like, okay. (laughs) I guess I'm going to Austin. Great. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to need to come up with some reason that I'm leaving work right now. But, (laughs) and it just happened really fast. And at the time, we had put our house on the market and it had sold. And we were like, just wanted a different house, which when I think about it now, it's like, we were obviously looking for some sort of change Change. and it really wasn't like we needed a different house, like, (laughs) but that's how it started. So then it was like our house sold. We hadn't found a new one. We're about to have to move into a rental. This job popped up in Austin and I got it immediately. And I remember talking to a friend I was like, do you think I'm we should do this. And she was like, how many more signs do you need? (laughs) I was like, I guess maybe you're right. Maybe we should try it. (laughs) So yeah. So then it was like a month later, we moved to Austin. And I had worked down here a a bunch of times. I had a friend that, that had had a little studio that I knew I could work out of. And uh, I, I just sort of, I didn't think, I guess I didn't really think. Um, (laughs) I just sort of assumed that I would be able to get get work, you know, blindly thinking, yeah, well, why wouldn't I be able to? 
And, you know, again, it took, I guess really the truth is like, it doesn't matter where you go. It's going to take, it takes a minute to get like into the scene and then mm. sort of, you know, but also I was also doing out, you know, out of town bands. And then at that point, people would just send me records to mix. And so they didn't have to be there. They could just send the files over the internet. So, uh, you know, I did a lot of that when we first moved to town. Like I built a mm. little mixing room in our garage. And then- With all of those construction them. skills that you learned from Freddie. Yeah, that's a blessing and a curse, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think the thing we didn't like really factor in was like how hard it was going to be to find a building that he could make a studio in Austin. Like not just and that. how expensive it is. Well, I was going to say not just how expensive, mm. but like like Dallas has like more like warehouse areas that mm. Austin really doesn't have. So there's not tons of like oh, buildings that you could just repurpose. And then when mm -hmm. you add oh and they're like five times more expensive than mm. like what you think they would cost it took several years and then he found a place that he started renting that it was a good space but it sold and was going to be turned into condos and so we were like okay there's like a shelf life or time life or whatever mm -hmm. for this studio like he can work out of it for two or three years but you still have to find the permanent space and so that was kind of like always kind of looming and then sort of another way that I always see these like parallels between me and Stuart like I took the job with women in their work in 2017 and two months later the building that they had rented for 25 years sold to become a hotel and so it was like, this place is gonna lose its home, you know? And it was like, you have two more years on your lease and then we need to find another place to rent or a place to buy. So like my professional life and my personal life, I'm like constantly thinking about like- these Real estate. That, real estate, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Commercial real estate. Yes. So yeah, like the end of- not the end of 2019, the fall of 2019, we found a house here that had a, a back house that had been used as a yoga studio. Mm. And we bought that because it had what would potentially turn into Stuart's studio, which it is now. Because that was the fall of 2019 was right before the world shut down. Yes. So, but you didn't know it was no. just very <laughs> fortuitous that you had this vision for this a home studio space, and then, and then it just kind of got pushed into fast forward. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Like the house was a dump. Yeah, it needed a lot of work, <laughs> but we were like, well, that can be fixed. The thing that's harder to do is to find this like back house. And so we were like, okay, we'll fix up this house. So we did that in the fall of 2019. And we we're like, 2020, we're just gonna take it easy. <laughs> Stuart's got yeah. another year at the place he's renting. Like, we're just not even gonna worry about that studio right away. Although Stuart like is always like designing studios. So like he kind of had a plan already. I did not. I did not have that in my plans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when did you start moving forward on transforming that into your studio now? In April of 2020. Okay. So right after everything shut it down. It became quickly like, apparent that I was not going to be able to afford the rent on the current place I was in. And they were, uh, they worked with me and they were cool. Like, about you know sort of giving me some rent a baby mm -hmm. and when they set that up i was like you know i might still not be able to afford this in in two months and they're like well we'll we'll deal with that 
in two months. And I was like, okay. So at that point it was just like, all right, we got to build the studio and get out as fast as possible. And, mm -hmm. and we built it differently than I thought we would do it. But it was also, yeah, it was right in the beginning of the pandemic. And so we were like, we don't want anybody in our house. Don't even look at our house. It's like, so we did it ourselves. Like, you know, we had to learn how to frame walls and like do all kinds of stuff, but it kept, well, at least kept me sane, it gave me something to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. So that was good. I mean, it was a lot of hard work, but it was fun. I thought for the most part doing it ourselves. Like we had, a, we had, I mean, there was some, obviously it wasn't fun at some points but <laughs> we're pretty we worked well together for the most part so it was you know it was, it was good yeah it was just a lot of hard labor at times but like now that it's yeah. done it's like wow I can't believe we did that like <laughs> and to be fair we had some people at the end who are pros come in and help finish it we had to like kind of dial back our like nobody's ever coming in here <laughs> and so we got lucky a friend of mine is in construction and so he's like yeah i know one of the guys that works for me he'll he he'll help you finish it out and he doesn't want to get paid he just wants to trade studio time for helping and i was like oh that sounds fantastic and he's now a super good friend of mine he's a great guy so yeah that was awesome like him and that him is awesome friend yeah what is the what's the best thing you did in your studio that you're the happiest what choice for your studio are you the happiest that you implemented I'm proud of is i'm i'm sort of shocked at how well we did with soundproofing it. i was gonna say the same thing because you can walk by and you know i could be playing drums and you you would hardly can tell when someone is no oh, so what did, what did you do for that did you do the, the it's rubber magic. I can't magic. talk about it okay no it's, it's just like you know air gap and then there's like two layers of heavy ass sheetrock and this green glue stuff that's really no fun to work with in between the two sheets of sheetrock and that was probably that's the worst part about doing it was that stuff um, yeah but the fact that it worked you're like okay like <laughs> yeah. made it worth it it made it worth it at yeah. the time it didn't seem like it was ever going to end because you do the first layer of sheetrock and you're like there's nothing oh. worse than putting up a second layer of drywall there's yeah. no <laughs> oh, you get no satisfaction to that it's just like oh yeah there's another piece yeah <laughs> So oh, you had to learn to pivot. How did, how did your work change, Diane, during the pandemic? What did what did your organization do differently? Amazing, oh, something amazing. Yeah, we, so like I said, we had been looking for a building for like almost mm -hmm. two years. And then in February of 2020, we found this building that was perfect. And we started doing like these fundraising cocktails like we did two and we well, like, they put the offer the offer had already gone accepted we had the offer to accept like february 2nd yeah okay. um so we were like okay we have till july to close on this building so we knew we were gonna have to move like really quickly to raise the funds and we did like two in-person like donor cultivation things and then we couldn't do that anymore and then like from March to maybe April, we were like, what are we gonna do? We are in a mess. <laughs> and so then we like totally changed the strategy and we're like, okay, we we still wanna buy this building. Like this pandemic has to end sometime and we want this organization to still be there. So we started doing fundraising on Zoom and told the story of the organization but also what it's like for women in the in the arts and a lot mm. of people don't realize but it's not good like <laughs> it's still like for every 
solo exhibition, maybe 10% of them are by female or women artists. Mm. So like kind of letting people know, like there is a need for this. And in a way, I think maybe the pandemic helped people like think about what was or is important. And like one of the things Mm -hmm. we would talk about is like, when we get on the other side of this, we want there to be a space for women artists and we want it to be you know, prominent and permanent and people really resonated with that. And so mm. most of the summer was just strictly like fundraising to get this building purchased. And then as we did that, you know, we did kind of the same things that a lot of organizations and museums did. Like we quickly turned everything digital. We did programming on Zoom and Mm -hmm. all, even like our art education materials that normally just would have been in the gallery. Like we made those accessible to the public. So yeah, it was a lot of like, okay, we still want to have some relationship but obviously it's not going to be in person so just trying to make connections that way and you know really kind of focusing on the members who are also artists because you know artists are struggling like yeah they were creating work but there's nowhere for it to be shown and so mm-hmm. trying to create opportunities for people to connect mm-hmm. um, that was kind of the main thing that we did And then we've continued doing that until we opened the building in July, like the digital programming. So, Mm -hmm. and it it seems like we'll keep doing that. Like now it'll be like kind of a mix of some in-person and some online. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. If it, is it something that you're going to do permanently? Cause you've had so much success um, with it. Uh, I, I feel like that, is just going to be the new norm for m- many industries, the, the combination yeah. between digital and in-person. And I, you know, I don't hate it. I mean, if yeah. I can get the technology to work, it, it's, you know, it's great. Yeah. I think that's what we found is like, our audience was mainly in Austin, but by being able to do things online, like we were reaching people Mm. across Texas and sometimes in other states as well. And it's like, yeah, we don't want to lose those people. So we want to keep, keep both things going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How has, other than building your studio, Stuart, how has, how, how did the lockdown pandemic, how did that shift how you do what you do or, or did it? What? Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> you know, I didn't really work. I mean, I did some some mixing, but it was pretty sparse. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it was awful. And yeah. it, there was the phase you would work with a few bands, but it would only be like people he knew and trusted, and everybody's wearing masks. And and then, yeah, it seemed to like open up a little bit but now it's kind of like (laughs) yeah it's like well once I guess it was May like when May hit like a lot of people had been vaccinated and like the floodgates kind of opened and then it was like Mm. round it's been pretty super busy um which has been awesome I remember the first you know like my friend was like we had booked a session and we had been working with masks and he's like, when's our next date we're recording? And I was like, it's whatever day it was. He's like, that'll be past two weeks from your shot, right? And I was like, yeah. Was like, we don't have to wear a mask then, do we? I was like, no. This so and exciting. it was the best session <laughs> I've had in forever. It was so great. <laughs> Maskless session. Oh, it was, it was, um, it was so great. So why do you guys stay in this artistic world? There's, uh, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. What keeps you going? What keeps you in it? Why, what do you get? What do you give? Uh, I can't imagine doing anything else. Like, I mean, that's not even a question that ever pops into my mind is why do I keep doing it? I mean, I love it. Like, I love working with people and helping 
make records. You know, that's kind of all I know how to do and what I truly love to do. How gratifying is it to see something that you helped in, that you helped polish, create? How gratifying is it to see it get the reception that the musicians and all hope for? Yeah, it's great. They deserve it. And it's, you know, most of the time they don't get it, you know. There's so many people that you know and I know that make fantastic music or paintings or whatever and you know they don't get the recognition that they deserve so when people do get it yeah it's like it's fantastic it's great how does it feel to you to be a part of that though oh i think it's cool i'm way more psyched for them and i mean i had a small part in it they're the ones who it was their you know i didn't write the song they wrote the song they're the band they're the the individual who did it, you know, I just didn't, I always feel pretty fucking lucky to be part of it. Well, I think that you might slightly underestimate your <laughs> contribution to what you do and what you do for the bands on a personal level and a professional level, because everybody that I know that has worked with you loves you not only as a friend but as I know. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> they they you know appreciate what you do professionally for them to help bring out their best um how about you diane what what keeps you in it what um makes it worth it to you yeah i mean i in a way, I guess similar to Stuart, like this is all I've done professionally is been in the art. So when I think about like, I could do whatever, I'm like, really? Like, you know, like, <laughs> like, I don't know, I don't know. And I feel like there's so many different avenues to go. Like when I think about, you know, starting as a practicing artist and being an educator and kind of moving into like different realms of working in the arts like there's just still so much more to explore so I, I think that's what kind of keeps me motivated is that I don't feel like there's like I'm at this plateau it's like well it's the same thing over and over um and then like it's it'll be like little things like when you give a school group, a tour, and like some student will say something so profound about mm -hmm. this artwork and you're just like, wow, like it really matters. And it's like, that's important to be a part of, I think for me anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I think that's all that I had, all, all the questions that I had. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask about that I can pick your brains about anything else you want to add I'm good okay. oh but thank you so much well thank you so much um for talking to me and let, letting me explore a little bit more about your artistic journey in this world and uh, how you do and why you do it and I really appreciate you taking the time today to sit down with me and talk to me and share some of your story and thank you guys all of you who are listening on the podcast or watching on youtube we appreciate you taking the time to sit with Stuart and diane sykes here some of the greatest people you'll ever know and we hope you've enjoyed the show and please like follow subscribe all the things to help get um, more people involved in watching these shows to pass it on thank you so much for joining us today on the artist collective radio show